singing Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood. If you know the song, please feel free to sing along. far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your side so you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you pay the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul, for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Jesus, you have saved my life. You brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Wash me white And thank you, Jesus You have saved my life Brought me from the darkness Into glorious light There is nothing stronger Than the wonder working power the 
What a wonderful way to start Super Sunday, amen? amen? I want to welcome everybody here this morning to Beaverdam Baptist Church. It's so good to see everybody. And for those that are visiting with us today, I want to encourage you to take a share card that you'll find in your pew pocket, place that, or fill that out and place that in the offering plate as that comes around a little bit later in our service. We'd love to have a record of your visit. We'd love to know how we as a church can minister unto you. Also, if you're a member of the church or uh, if this isn't your first time, we would still love to know any prayer needs you have, anything we can do to come alongside you and pray for you um, in your walk with Christ. It's an exciting day and I have a few announcements I'd like to make. First of all, these beautiful flowers here. They are given for the glory of God. And so I wanted to mention that. Also, there is a new Sunday school class that's going to be starting up the first Sunday. They're going to meet in the sanctuary, going to kind of see how many people um, are interested. It is a new discipleship class entitled Designed to Be Like Him. And it's taught by Gary Barrett. And so he'll be teaching that uh, in the sanctuary. This is uh, extremely valuable for people that have just come to Christ, people that have newly been baptized, people that have not yet gone through a new believers class. This would be a perfect class to be a part of. Uh, so especially if you're not in Sunday school, uh, come and see what this is all about and be a part of this new class if you're not in a Sunday school class currently. So that's going to start next Sunday. Also next Sunday, we're going to have in our morning service a deacon ordination for Marion Smith. So uh, that's exciting and please come be a part of that. We're going to have just a time of, of laying the laying on of the hands, and there will be a charge to him as well as a sermon to the congregation as we ordain him as a new deacon. Um, also, just want to remind everybody, Super Sunday doesn't stop after this service. We have an evening service tonight at 6 o'clock p.m., and uh, Brother Mark's going to be back with us again tonight, um, as well as this morning, and we're going to have a community choir from Peters Creek, Evergreen, and Beaver Dam all together. It's going to be just a great time to come and to worship and to fellowship and to uh, come together. Now there's one last thing I want to do. Here at Beaver Dam Baptist Church, we honor the Word of God. We want to be able to come together and to sit under not just the preaching of God's Word, but it's very valuable that we're a part of discipleship in the small group realm, in Sunday school, and in other avenues. And God has blessed us with faithful teachers who study God's Word and who are passionate week in, week out, Sunday in, Sunday out, of teaching God's Word and being prepared to do that and being prayerful in doing that. One of those servants has done this consecutively, Sunday in, Sunday out, for 60 years. 60 years here at Beaverdam Baptist Church, this teacher has been faithful to bringing the Word. And so at this time, I'd like to ask Thurman Smith if he would join me here in the front. We want to present Thurman with this beautiful picture. Thurman, we are proud of you. We are grateful to God for you, the way that God has used and is using you here at Beaver Dam Baptist Church to teach God's Word. You are a model for us all. Thank you, brother. Let's give another round of applause. Okay. God's been faithful to me for 80 years. Our Sunday school lesson taught me if I got depressed enough that I need to focus on who God is and what God does. He's all powerful. He's all wise. And He has carried me through 
almost 50 years, 60 years of teaching, and never have let me down. You can find trust, and you can find love, and you can find relationship with your family and father. They asked Thurman last night, how long you, or I think it was how long you've been teaching. I said, he was teaching when Jesus was a teenager. <laughs> so. Our praise hymn this morning is entitled Waymaker. Let's stand as we sing.
What a joyful blessing it is to be in your house today, Father. To come and worship and sing praises unto you, Father. And Lord, we thank you so much that we have the opportunity now, Father, to give back to you, Father, because you so dearly blessed us, Lord. And then, Father, I ask you to speak to the one that's fixing to bring the message to us now, that our hearts will be blessed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus, for being so good to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I wonder how many of us have been through trials that you just didn't know if you were going to get through without God. I know uh, several months ago I had some health problems and it was tough for a while, but I knew, I knew the outcome already. I knew God was going to bring me through it. And that's what the song talks about. He's going to take us, be with us even through the fire. So many times I've questioned certain circumstances or things I couldn't understand. Many times in trials, weakness blurs my vision and my frustration, it gets so out of hand. Oh, it's then I am reminded I've never been forsaken I've never had to stand the test alone As I look at all the victories The Spirit rises up in me And it's through the fire my weakness is made strong Oh, He never promised that the cross would not get heavy or the heel would not be hard to climb he never offered victories without fighting but he said help would always come in time just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision and the adversary says, give me, just hold on. Our Lord will show up, and he will take you through the fire again. I know within myself that I would surely perish. But if I trust the mighty hand of God, He'll shield the flame again, again. He never promised that the cross would not get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb. He never offered our victories without fighting but he said help would always come in time 
Just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision And the adversary says give me Just hold on Our Lord will show up And He will take you through the fire again Just hold on Our Lord will show up and he will take you through the fire again. quick announcement before I introduce the speaker. Next Sunday morning starts our new church year, first Sunday in September. And uh, as I'd mentioned, I think last week, uh, starting Sunday, grades third through fifth will stay here in the sanctuary and worship within the church. All other grades would go on to children's church. So that will start next Sunday. Just want to remind everybody of that. It's an honor to have Mark Krieger with us today. He's from Belton, South Carolina, and uh, he's from Mount um, Bethel. Is it Mount Bethel? Mount Bethel Baptist Church. And uh, we're just so glad to have him. Last year, he preached at our 911 Sunday, and I mean, he really tore it up. God really moved through him and uh, felt like the Lord was leading me to ask him if he would come again and he would preach to us this morning and preach to us tonight on this super sunday so brother mark will you please come and uh pray the lord all right my own brother sounds like i am well good morning church uh it's great to be back with you at beaver dam baptist church I was grateful to be with you all last year, part of your 9-11 service. As I think about it, what a great opportunity to gather together as a church and to um, celebrate, but also to remember those who have sacrificed much for the freedoms that we enjoy here together as we look back at that horrific day of 9-11. Uh, but even through that tragic time, we've seen the goodness, grace, and the mercy of Almighty God. And thankful to hear uh, some of our heroes today, our first responders, and to be a part of that service Thank you, and um, I don't know about tearing it up. I don't know if that meant good or bad, but I'm glad to be invited back to be with you here today at Beaver Dam Baptist Church. So if you would find your place in God's Word, uh, Exodus chapter number 17, Exodus chapter number 17. My good thing, uh, she could not be with us today. She's back home uh, with the rest of our clan. Uh, as I shared with you last time, uh, I'm blessed with a wonderful wife. I've been married going on well, 24 years. Next year will be 25 years. Thankful for her. We have, we have six children. Uh, three of them are already grown. And since I was with you last time, I have two grandchildren there on their way. One will be here uh, in October, some, oh, November, excuse me, and then the other one will be here around the first of the year. So I praise God for his blessings upon me and my family. And I always amazed as I was talking to my wife about that. I said, we're going to have grandbabies. I don't feel that old, and baby, you're definitely not that old. And then I said, I can't believe we're going to have grandbabies, and we have a two-year-old at our house. That seems unbelievable, but that's how God works those things out. So I'm thankful for my wife, my family, thankful for my wonderful church, uh, be able to pastor there. Been there six years, just a few months ago. Thankful for God's blessings at Mount Bethel Baptist Church, and I'm thankful for Beaver Dam and all that God has done and all God is doing, and I'm thankful ahead of time what God will do. I'm thankful for your pastor, 
his faithfulness to, to preach God's word, but also pastor the church. And I was thinking as I was leading up to the day, over in the book of Revelation, uh, chapters 2 and 3, we find as John the Revelator is giving a glimpse uh, of the message that Christ gives to his church, it's there that we see Christ depicted amongst his church. He's amongst the uh, golden lampstands, and then he's holding something in his hand. He's holding the angels of the church. The angel of the church is the pastor of the church. And it is those pastors that the Lord Jesus was addressing. And he gives them a message of accommodation, but also a word of correction. And so no matter what state the church is in, God gives pastors to the church to help lead and guide them as the shepherd, the head pastor, if you will, the Lord Jesus Christ leads us. So you continue to encourage your pastor. You uplift him. You support him. Uh, God has brought you a great preacher, but he's also brought you a great pastor. And so be thankful for that. Be thankful for the man of God. But if you found your place in God's Word and you're physically able, I would invite you to stand with me for just a moment in reverence for the reading of God's Word. If you would stand with me. Exodus chapter number 17. And I want to begin reading in verse number 8, so if you would follow along with me. The Bible says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and repped them. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him, and he fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and they put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed his hands, one on the uh, one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady unto the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out from remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Beaver Dam, I'm going to take just a few more minutes of our time that we have together, and I'm going to share this truth from our text. Raising and staying the banner together. Raising and staying the banner together. Would you pray with me? Father, again, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for the great time of worship that we've already had. Thank you for the wonderful time of fellowship and discipleship that we've had in Sunday school this morning. And Lord, we're thankful for the time that we have to gather around your word in these moments that we have. And my prayer is today that we've come not only to be hearers, but Father, we'll be doers of your word. And it's my prayer that I make in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Once again, raising and staying the banner together. I'm just going to be honest with you. I had probably about four or five messages that I really would love to have preached. And so if you're willing to stay around for a while, I can go ahead and preach all them. Or I'll just preach the one that the Lord really uh, laid upon my heart heavy over the past few days from Exodus chapter number 17. As we look at life, we often have in two outlooks, if you will. Sometimes there's that uh, pessimistic view of life, meaning it's rough. It's going to be the same moving forward. For others, they are optimistic. They look, they think it's definitely got, got to get better from here. And that's kind of my prayer as I look out into the future of uh, our horizon as it relates to us as a nation, as a people, and just the world in general. I, I want to be optimistic. It's going to have to get better from here. In either case, we must be realistic is my perspective. Uh, I can assure you as we look out over our lives and we look out into the horizon of what lies ahead, the Lord Jesus summarizes it very well when he says, In this world you will have tribulation. Beloved, there will always be times in our life of persecution. Uh, the Bible says that any one of us that seeks to live godly will endure persecution. It's a fact. Uh, there will be times of temptation. Our Lord Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. There will be times of tribulation. As I read that verse just a moment ago, Jesus said, In this world you will have tribulation. We can't escape it. We can't avoid it. We can expect it one time or another in varying ways or another. There'll be time of deception. There's an enemy of this world. He's lurking and he's not alone. He has a lot of individuals that are on his same team, if you will. I'm speaking of Satan and all the demonic forces that are active in our world today, deceiving us. The reason is that we, you and I, live in a fallen world. This is not how God intended it. If we go back to Genesis 
beginning there in creation, we see how God intended it. When he did something, he said it was good. And the world was good, and our relationship with God was good. But along came sin, and sin has impacted every aspect of our lives. It's impacted, first and foremost, our relationship with God. That relationship was severed there in the garden because of our own sin. You see, we're all born in Adam, and after Adam, we all sin. It also impacts our relationships with one another. You find that being played out with Adam and his dear wife Eve. But then you also find that with their siblings and the battle and the disagreements and the murder that transpired from there. And we go down from there. So we're not necessarily getting better. We're oftentimes getting worse. Or the evidence of our sin is being played before our very eyes. As we look in our text today, we find Moses and Israel confronted with that very reality. We find them confronted with a battle or the sufferings and the tribulations of this world. And as we look at... Uh, Exodus chapter number 17, there are just two main points that I want to bring to your attention. And with the Lord's help, I'm going to try my best to get through them in a speedily manner. But you're going to notice there is a battle, but there's also a banner. There's a battle, and there's a banner. Let's first consider that battle and talk about it for just a few moments. There are multiple aspects of the battle in our text that we're going to consider as we make our way through it. And as we make our way through the text, we bear in mind that the battle is a literal battle. The literal battle in the sense that Moses and Israel, they fought with Amalek. It's a literal battle. It's a physical battle. This is a real situation that took place with the nation of Israel. But that battle also carries over not only to the physical realm, but into the spiritual and the emotional realm and the mental realm of those that are in the midst of the battle. We have to bear that in mind as we consider the battle. But we also must consider this Understanding as we go through God's Word. I know your pastor does a great job at this. I've listened to him from time to time as his services are shared here on Facebook. But there's an interpretation. What does this text even mean to us? There's an explanation. And then there's an application for me and you in our lives and also as it relates to us as a church in the New Testament era because the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter number 3 as Paul's reminding and reassuring Timothy of the charge and the call that was placed upon his life, he reminds him about the Word of God. He said, you've known the Scriptures, Timothy. You've known them since you were a child. Your mother and your grandmother taught them, and they led you to faith in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to tell us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and therefore it is profitable for you and I. And so I'm thankful for the Old Testament. I'm thankful for the New Testament. I'm thankful for the Word of God. You can't unhitch one from the other. Amen? It is God's written inspired, inerrant, and follow the Lord. It's good for us today. And so as James says, don't be just a hearer this morning. Be a doer. Be a doer. So God is going to be speaking. He's going to be ministering to every one of our hearts. It's my prayer as we leave here today. We'll leave here changed for the better. But the Bible tells us here as we look at our text, there's a battle. As we look at the battle, we're going to notice first the field of battle. And the Bible gives us a very clear definition or description about the place of this battle. The Bible tells us that it was in Rephtim. It was a place that was located in, uh, between the wilderness of Sin and the wilderness of Sinai. What's interesting in this place was the path that the Lord had led Israel himself. In fact, this morning I was going back and just rereading over the account of all that was taking place leading up to this battle that took place in Exodus 17. You find them being led out by God's great power and his might as he sends Moses to be this deliverer and to tell Pharaoh a simple message, let my people go. And then you find them as God leads them out. He leads them directly to what we know as the Red Sea. And it's there that God was going to use this to display his power even further in the destruction of Pharaoh and the armies that pursued after them. And so he leads them through, as it were, on dry ground. He consumes up uh, the enemy that was behind them. He leads them out uh, through the wilderness of sin. It's there that they realize they don't have anything to eat. And they begin complaining. Oh, they go complaining. Go figure, right? God's people complaining. But as they're complaining, God answers the intercession of Moses, and he calls out to them, and God feeds them in that wilderness. And then God leads them again. They take up the tabernacle, I mean, pick up their tents, and they move forward once again. And they are led to this wilderness, into this valley of Rephdom. And so while they're here, the Lord has been leading them. How do we know that he's leading them? The cl cloudy pillar by day and the cloudy pillar of fire by night. The Spirit of God was leading, guiding them, and directing them. 
And as he led them through this uh, foreign territory, he leads them, if you will, right into the midst of a battle. And oftentimes, as you and I go about our lives and we truly seek God, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? What is the path that you have set before me? And sometimes we feel as though if we're following or getting right in God's will, we're listening as he leads us, that somehow or another we're not going to get into the middle of that fire as my brother led us in that song just a moment ago. But what we learn is as you and I are following God and we're listening to him, sometimes God leads us to the very battle that you and I would often like to avoid. And so as I think about the battle, the field of battle, we're going to notice that it's a universal battle. It's going to happen one way or another. We've already determined that in the beginning. Persecution, temptation, we're all going to experience it. It's unavoidable, beloved. If you're going to live godly and you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to face a battle with the spiritual wickedness of this world. As I think about entering into that battle and being in the midst of that battle, it was in March 2003, Bravo Company 37 Infantry Regiment, part of Task Force 369, positioned themselves on the border of Kuwait and Iraq. It was that day that the border began to be prepared for forces to make their way and ultimately make their way to Baghdad, a part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And it was then, early in the morning, that Bravo Company, part of 369 Task Force, made their way across the berm that separated Kuwait from Iraq. And it was in that moment that things changed. They changed in this sense that they entered into the arena or the battlefield. And they were in the middle of the battlefield from that time until they came back home. I was taught that several years earlier in basic training at Fort Benning during infantry training school. It was there while I was there. We went through a simulation of battle. Now, I don't know about you. I'm 45 years old. I grew up playing G.I. Joe. I don't know about you. I love G.I. Joe. That's, that was my envision. I envision that for myself. I, I'm going to be a G.I. Joe. So I was ultimately, when I went to basic training, I was living out my lifelong dream. I'm, I'm a G.I. Joe, okay? And so we get there to basic training, and we get a battle buddy. Everybody gets a battle buddy. And my battle buddy and I, we were given instruction as we went to this training session that day on how to advance upon an objective. And as you went, you would do some, some things like this. You would both be laying in the prone supported position. I'm going to demonstrate that because I've gotten a little older. It might be a little harder for me to get up. But uh, you get down and you, and you get in this ready position. And you're looking downrange. And so as you make your way forward, you would communicate with your battle buddy. And your battle buddy would say, he says, um, he would get up and he would say this in his mind. I'm up, he sees me, I'm down. And before he'd get up, he'd say, cover me while I move. And so we're doing this, and I'm telling you what, in my mind, no lie. I said, man, we are high speed. Uh, we're moving together flawlessly. We're communicating with one another. and We're just about to this objective that we were to take over. And all of a sudden, out to my left, I hear this noise. Bang, 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 bang. Bang, 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 bang. And I start looking to my left, and it's our drill sergeant. They've done taken their, uh, their, their uniform. They've turned it inside out. It's practically white. They're carrying uh, M16s, and they're yelling out from the wood line, bang, 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 bang. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. And that day, they used my, buddy, my battle buddy, myself, as an illustration, a teaching lesson about the battle. It was in that moment, as they brought us together, they said, listen, Krieger, listen, Ainsworth, the battle is not right in front of you. The battle is all around you. You see, many times you and I as believers in Christ, we somehow or another think that the battle is just always right in front of us. But oh, how true it is, the battle is always all around us. We must always stay alert. We must always be ready for that battle that lies ahead of us. So we notice here this field of battle. We notice the enemy that was being faced, but we notice this plan that if you will, Moses takes up in order to confront this battle with Amalek on the field of battle. It's in here that he instructs Moses and the armies to go up and fight with Amalek, and, to take, and he would take the rod, and him and Aaron and Hur would go up to the hill. And it's there that action begins to take place. Now, I want to share this with you. Inject. Historically, strategically, military leaders would take a place of elevation and survey the battlefield to track the progression and formulate a battle plan from there. And they would communicate to everyone around them, this is what we're doing, and this is how we're going to accomplish it. 
It's interesting to know, as you think about Moses, Moses wasn't a soldier, he was a shepherd. It's also interesting to know that the sl- Israel were slaves, they were not soldiers, but they find themselves in the midst of the battle. Hmm. Yet, we notice this confrontation, the battle could not be avoided. They had entered the arena. Beloved, we notice here that the battle is being waged in and around our lives as well. As you and I seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, when we profess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you and I have entered into the battle. Because as I think about it, the Hebrew writer tells us that we have no continuing city here, but we seek one to come. Really, we're ambassadors in this world. We represent another king and another kingdom. Our kingdom is coming. Jesus comes preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This world is not our home. When you and I profess Christ, we're looking onward and upward, right? We're looking for the day when we come to know and see Jesus face to face. But in the midst of this world that you and I live in, the battle is being waged on a daily basis. The battle with temptation. The battle with tribulation. The battle with persecution as you and I seek to live godly and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The confrontation, the battle could not be avoided. But there's something else here. We notice the the foe in the midst of the battle. You find that there in verse number 8 and verse number 16. It's there in verse number 8. It tells us, then came Amalek and fought with Israel and reft them. You go on to verse number 16 and the Bible says, For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will war with Amalek from generation to to generation. There are two things there about the foe in the battle. It's an age-old foe, and it's also a lifelong foe. The text tells us that came Amalek and fought with Israel. The text also tells us because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Who is Amalek then? Who is this Amalek and these Amalekites that Israel would be fighting with at this moment, but also the generations that would come in the future? You see, Amalek is a descendant of Esau. These descendants organized themselves in a very national, nomadic group. You find over there in Numbers 24, verse number 20, it says that they were the first of those nations that lived partly by attacking populations and groups. They would ride upon camels and they would swiftly move upon their enemy, destroying them, taking everything they could and killing off the men and leading the children and women into slavery. This is the battle that was with Amalek. It's interesting as you go in and you consider the idea of generations that King Saul also battled with Amalek in 1 Samuel chapter number 15, verse number 23. He was instructed by the Lord to do away with Amalek and everyone, but he didn't do as the Lord had said. And it's there that the anointing was removed from his life. King David battled with Amalek as well. We find him, as he battles with Amalek, that there was a raid in Ziklag. It's there that he had put back his wife and his children, and all of his followers put up their wives and their children. They put back their possessions, and then they're they're taken away in the wee hours of the night. And David comes back, and he's brokenhearted because of his children and his wife that were taken hostage. You find that battle with Amalek going all through the pages of Scripture. You find it with Queen Esther as she's battling with Haman. Remember, Haman, the Agite, descendant of Amalekite king, wanted to destroy the nation of Israel, the race of the Israeli people from off the face of the earth. And so when we read right here, this battle with Amalek is an age-old battle. It's a lifelong battle. It's a battle that would go on from generation to generation. To generation we can conclude something about that battle his attacks are ruthless and relentless he's always looking for those who are vulnerable to overcome them as we think about Amalek Amalek is a picture in a age-old battle a lifelong battle man has with sin and Satan a battle that's been being waged from since the very beginning as Adam and Eve were tempted in the garden to disobey God and that battle has been going on since then When we're tempted by sin and we give in to sin, we give in to those lusts of our flesh, we are turned over to our own sinfulness. However, that battle goes on every single day. The sinfulness in our own lives, the sinfulness in our own world. That battle will go on until we all go to heaven. The field, the foe. But you notice something about this battle. There's fatigue in the midst of the battle, don't you? In verse 9 through verse number 13, I won't read it all again there, but we find as Moses says, Aaron, I mean, 
Uh, Joshua, you go out into the battle. You take certain captains and leaders, and you fight with Amalek there. And I, I'll go up to the side of the hill, and I'll take Aaron and her with me. And it's there that I'll lift up the rod. But as he's in the midst of the battle, the Bible tells us that his arms got heavy. And as his arms got heavy, the Bible tells us that Amalek prevailed in the battle. But when his arms were raised, it's then that Israel prevailed in the battle. As I think about that, as you and I seek to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, some of you have been, my brother right here has been teaching Sunday school, would you say 60 years? The battle is not easy. There's fatigue. I can imagine 60 years of teaching Sunday school. There were some Sundays you got up, I don't want to go teach Sunday school this week. There were some times as you began to teach Sunday school or lead in children's ministry or pastor the church, preach God's Word, lead your families well, be a father that loves the Lord Jesus, loving your wife, wives, submitting yourselves and coming under the leadership of your husband, leading and guiding and directing. In the midst of this battle, the battle gets difficult. There's fatigue physically. There's fatigue mentally and spiritually. We find Moses demonstrating that to us as he's in the midst of the battle. His arms are heavy, and it's then the enemy prevails. And when his hands were lifted up, it's then that Israel prevailed. How many of us, when we get our hands heavy, we get focused on ourselves, it's then that we begin to realize that the enemy begins to overwhelm us. How many of you comes to us and deceives us, lies to us continually? discouraging us. There's no reason to continue on. Don't teach that Sunday school class no more. It'd be better to go on fishing. Don't pastor that church no more. Go and give up, give in. They're not listening to you. Go on and you do what you want to do. Don't teach those children no more. Don't go down there to Good News Club. Don't share your faith with your friends and your family. Beloved, there's a battle, and that battle gets difficult. It gets difficult trying to live out as a father, a godly father, a godly wife, a godly mother, or a Christian in general, the battle is difficult. I was reminded of David. David was a man that was familiar with these ups and downs and the troubles of life. In Psalm 13, he says, How long will you forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? I've been told and I've heard it said that we don't question. We don't ask questions. And somehow or another we're supposed to muster up enough. But what I find here is a man after God's own heart, a man who that served God, slayed the giant, he's in a situation in his life where he feels overwhelmed and overcome in the midst of the battle. And he's at the place where he's asking, God, where are you? How many of you have ever been there, beloved? How many of you have ever been there when the battle's getting difficult, you've been raising your hands, you've been trying to move forward in the fight, but you feel like you can't go on anymore? Where are you, God? Are you going to come to my side? Are you going to aid me? He goes on to say, Consider, hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble rejoice over me when I am moved. There have been many times, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, I felt like giving in, giving up. I felt like taking the flag of white and surrendering and saying, Lord, I don't want to do it no more. I've done it as a pastor, pastor. There have been some days on a Monday where I've gone in there, and I'm just telling you what, I've walked through the church, I've been frustrated, and I said, I don't understand. I don't know what's going on here. I just want to give up and give in. And so all of a sudden, the Spirit of God begins to minister to my heart. He said, Mark, are you done? You see, the Lord never promised that things would be easy. There'll be difficult times being a deacon. There'll be difficult times being a Sunday school teacher, a youth minister, children's minister. It'll be get difficult on your job in life. There is a battle, and that battle is being waged all around of us. But the key in the battle is this. The battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. I, I don't want to ruin the plot, but if you will, go over there. The Bible says in verse number 16, it says, For he said, who said that? Yahweh, Jehovah Nisi said, the Lord our banner said this. He said, I will war with Amalek from generation to generation. He didn't say you would war with him. He said, I would war with him. Beloved, that's where we must find our rest. That's where we find our strength. It is not in ourselves, it's in our Lord. And that's where we come to not only the battle that's being waged all around us as we look at Moses and the people of Israel and their battle with Amalek, 
There's the banner. Now, real two things, real quickly, about the banner. We notice the raising of the banner and the staying of the banner in the battle. Let's first consider raising the banner. What we learn from our text is this. Raising the banner is the only way that you and I could ever confront, the only way that you and I could combat, the only way that you and I could conquer the enemy. Once again, we've got to understand, this is Moses in the battle with Amalek, and the only way that they ever won is when he lifted up what? The rod. Some of you see me bringing this in. I was joking. I said, this is for my son. Some lady said, don't do that, boy. Come over here with me. I'll protect you from your daddy. Sometimes I might need to use it on him. He's a knucklehead. I was a knucklehead. You were a knucklehead too, right? But if you remember when God called Moses, he had a rod in his hand, didn't he? And you remember, he's calling him, he's telling him, listen, I want you to go back where you left. And it's then that Moses starts having all these excuses why he can't go back. How many of us have had excuses? That's a whole other message. And he says, what's in your hand? Moses, my rod. So that rod was an implement that was used by the shepherd in shepherd. It would be used for protection, guiding, and directing the sheep. And so the sheep are always familiar with the rod and the shepherd. They were always together. And that rod, he says, take your rod, and he said, I'm not going to throw it. And someone said that earlier, you throw that rod down, there's a snake handler here, I don't know. I thought that was in the mountains of North Carolina, not the low country of North Carolina. But you see, you take that rod, and you throw it down, it turns into what? A serpent. You pick it back up, it'll turn back into a rod. Beloved, let me tell you, there's no power in the rod. The power is in the Lord. What the rod was, was a representation of the power of God, the presence of God, and the providence of God amongst His people. Because wasn't it the rod that He tells him? It's there. As you read through your Bibles, He says, you take your rod. Remember, they're there in the valley. They're complaining again. They're complaining. There's no water to drink down here. He said, Moses, take your rod and strike the rock. Water gushed out from there. You take your rod, you go stand before Pharaoh, and he says he doesn't want to believe you and let your people go. You cast down the rod. The rod then becomes the serpent. It consumes the other serpents. The rod is always a representation of God's presence, God's power, and God's providence amongst his people. And so whenever Moses goes up to the hillside, he's carrying his rod with him. And as he's carrying his rod with him, the rod, as it described here in our text, it tells us there that in this moment, he describes it, the Lord, in the victory that the Lord had brought to them, Jehovah Nisi. That word Nisi is the understanding to this rod. The word Nisi means signal pole. Sometimes in military terms, there would be a battle and they would wave certain flags as a representation of what to do during the battle. But in this text, what we understand about Nisi in this signal pole is not in the sense of a flag that's being raised, but all, a pole. A pole that would be designed or laden with decoration. This pole would be used as a way of demonstrating Moses raising his hands and grabbing a hold of the presence of God. What did the Lord tell Moses when he would go before Pharaoh? He said, won't I go with you? You see, many of us, as you and I go into the battle, we feel as though we go on our own, we're by ourselves. But in the New Testament days, we're never alone, we're never by ourselves. What does the Bible say? The Lord Jesus said, I'll send you forth a comforter. And we are indwelt with the Spirit of God. The young lady in our Sunday school class made reference to that Spirit as it relates to us. And some in the Old Testament might look towards us and say, Wow, what an incredible blessing. You have the presence and the power and the providence of God in your life. Not only a representation of it in the midst of a rod. Beloved, He walks with us. He talks with us every step of the way. Amen. He is our strength. He is our source of joy. He has become our salvation. And so as Moses goes up to the hillside, he's bringing the presence of God. And as he raises up the rod in the midst of the battle with Amalek, he's signifying that I can't win the battle on my own. I don't have the ability. 
I don't have the authority to win the battle on my own, but Lord, I'm clinging to who you are. I'm clinging to your promise that you've not left us. You've not led us out here to abandon us. But in this moment, you're going to give me the victory. You see, as you begin to serve God and you go out in the midst of the battle, you cling to the promises. Lord, you've called me to be a father. You've called me to be a wife. You've called me to be a teacher. You've called me to be an evangelist and ambassador to the nations. I cannot do it on my own, but I'm clinging to the promises, the providence, the power of Almighty God. God, amen. His power is not limited. The only time His power is limited is by our own unbelief. But that still does not limit the fact that in the midst of the battle, the battle does not get wearisome, tiresome. Once again, Moses has been holding his hands up for some time. As he's holding his hands up physically, his arms are getting heavy. Spiritually, as he's interceding on the behalf of the people, he's getting weary. Emotionally, as he's looking upon Joshua in the midst of the battle, emotionally, physically, mentally, as he's beginning to contemplate, are we going to win this battle? His arms get heavy. And the Bible says when his arms got heavy and he let it down, Amalek prevailed. And when he raised up his hands, it's then that Israel prevailed. And in the midst of that battle, God was bringing victory. But in that moment of raising and staying the banner, he had someone come along beside of him and help. Hmm. Pastor, I'm thankful for those people that help us in the midst of the battle. There might be a text message someone sends me and says, Pastor, I love you and I'm praying for you. Brother, I love you and I'm praying for you. Go through the valley in your life. A loved one passes on. The church comes along beside you and they help raise up your hands. You're battling with something in your life. You're dealing with some struggles in your life. Some brother comes along beside of you and says, man, I've walked in those shoes. I know where you are. I'm going to help you lift up the name of Jesus. I'm not going to abandon you on the battlefield. I'm going to help you trust in the Lord. As we go through the battle, I'm so thankful to know there are people that will help me to cling to the promises of God. Help me to hold on to him in the midst of the battle. Because it's then that you and I experience the victory that is, is the Lord's. It is only in him that you and I can overcome the enemy. Let me just share a couple of verses. The hour has gotten away from us. The battle is not ours. It's the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter number 20, verse number 15. It says, Hearken. All you of Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of the great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. 1 Samuel 17, verse number 47 says, This day with the Lord deliver thee into thy hand. Go down to verse number 47, it says, And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into his hand. Second Chronicles 32, verse number 7, it says, Be strong, courageous, nor be afraid, nor dismayed, for the king of Assyria, for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than that with them. With him is an arm of flesh, but with the Lord our God to our help, to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might, not by power, but through my spirit. Says who? Says the Lord of hosts. Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Once again, we are in a literal, physical, spiritual, emotional battle. And in the midst of that battle, we understand the sphere of that battle. We understand the scope of that battle. We understand the significance of that battle. It can be overwhelming and overpowering. But when we lift up the banner in the midst of the battle, we lift up the power, we lift up the providence of Almighty of God. We cling to who He says He is. He is the Lord. Amen. His name means Yahweh. His name in the Old Testament, Yahweh, is the covenant God of Israel. And the covenant is something that God has entered into with His people. And He keeps His word. Amen. He keeps and does what He says He will do. So when He says, I'll walk with you, He'll walk with you. When He says He's your strength, He's your strength. When He says, I'm your joy, He's your joy. When He says, I'm your shelter in the storm, He's your shelter. When He says, I'm your salvation, He is your salvation. When he says, I'm your shepherd, I am your shepherd. When he says, I'll go through the valley with you, he'll go through the valley with you. When he says, I'll lead you to the plateaus, he'll lead you to the
the plateaus. The Lord is exactly who He says. We must only cling to what He says. Amen? And so in the midst of the battle, hold on to who the Lord is. But when it gets difficult, why don't you be like the one, Aaron and her? They come beside Moses and helped him raise and stay the banner. So we stay it for ourselves, but we help stay it for others. As I think about that today, hmm. Paul encouraging and strengthening Timothy. Jesus encouraging and strengthening Paul while he's in the prison cell. The angels encouraging and strengthening Jesus as he comes through his temptation. The angel encouraging and strengthening Joshua. The Lord encouraging and strengthening Gideon. The Lord encouraging and strengthening Elijah. The Holy Spirit encouraging and strengthening us. Sometimes we need to be attentive and active in the midst of the battle because all of us are in the battle together. And as we go through the battle, we must come along beside of one another and help stay the banner. Beloved, as we think about these great truths from God's Word today, raising and staying the banner, I want to ask you a great question today. This all begins with our relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus over there in John tells us about how Moses raised up the serpent. And the Bible says that whoever lived towards that raisin, brazen serpent, they could be saved from what bit them or per brought them to perishing. Beloved, Jesus was raised between heaven and earth. As he was raised between heaven and earth, he took upon our sin who knew no sin, that we could be made the righteousness of God in Him. He died with our sin. He was placed in a tomb. Three days later, He got up in victory. And the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, can, will, shall be saved. Just as it was with Moses looking towards the serpent, we must look to Him who was lifted up. Amen? The only way to be saved is by believing in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. My question today is, are you saved? Have you believed in Jesus? Because Jesus has already won the victory. I heard a preacher say years ago, I'm not fighting for victory. I'm fighting from it. I'm living from victory. Your victory is in the Lord, our Savior forever, the great hymn says. And so today, you need to make your way down here this morning and Believe upon Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That might mean grabbing your pastor by the hand and saying, Pastor, I'm not certain about my salvation, but I want to know for certain today that I am a believer in Christ. So you need to make your way down to this altar this morning. Some of you are in that battle as well. You're in that battle emotionally, physically, and spiritually. You feel as though you're being overcome and overwhelmed. You've been trying to raise the banner. You've been trying to hold or cling to the promises of God. You've been trying to cling to the, to the providence of God in your life. But in the midst of the battle, your hands have gotten weary. and You've let it down. You've gotten discouraged. You feel defeated. You need to make your way down to the altar today. You need to call out to the Lord. You need to turn to Him and trust in Him once again. The Bible says, cast all your care upon Him. Because He cares for you. For some of us, we need to come along beside those others that are in the midst of the battle and help them raise and stay the banner. We don't need to abandon them on the battlefield. We don't need to forsake them. Some of them may have fallen into temptation. Some of them may have given over into the things of the world, but it's not time for us to kick them while they're down. It's time for us to help raise them up. It's to help encourage them and help them along the way, beloved. So maybe you need to also join those others that will be making their way down to this altar this morning. Calling out to God. There are others here today that need to be baptized. You've never been baptized. You've never made an open profession of your faith in Jesus. And you need to move forward with believer's baptism. So as these others are making their way down here this morning, you also need to make your way down here. Some others have been visiting this church, this faith family. You've been talking about it. You've been praying about it. You've been thinking about it. Now is the day for you to become part of this church. You need to come as these others are making their way down here this morning. 
So raising and staying the banner, we do it together. As you stand with me and bow your heads, Father, we're thankful for the day that you've given us, the great privilege of being here this morning. Lord, I'm so thankful to know in the midst of the battle, the battle is yours, it's not ours. Oh, Father, there have been times in my life I've been so discouraged. I have felt so defeated. I have been overwhelmed with the circumstances going on in and around my life. I have felt many a times that I can't go on. There's no reason to go on. I have often felt, Lord, in the midst of those times, there's no reason for me to continue doing what I'm doing. But, Lord, how I was reminded that that battle is yours and not mine. You are my victory. Lord, you are my strength. Lord, you are my source of joy. Lord, you have become my salvation. And so it's in those moments, Lord, that I've had to cling. I've had to cling to your promises because, Father, that's all I could see. That's all I could hold on to by faith, by trust, by believing in you. Everything in and around my life has told me I cannot continue on. But Lord, I've been so thankful for those who have come along beside of me in those battles. And they've helped me again to raise the banner. They've helped me as I've been weary. And Father, I just believe this morning there are some here today that are weary. They've been in this battle. And they feel as though they can't continue on. Some have been teaching and telling their children about Jesus and some have wandered away. Lord, can they continue? Yes, they can. Maybe this is the time we come along beside of one another as parents and help encourage one another on in the midst of the battle. Father, I know this dear pastor has been in a battle. Oh Lord, how wonderful it would be There'd be some godly men that would come along beside of him and help him raise his hands as he lifts your name up. Lord, help us today to trust you because it's in you that we experience the victory. Lord, I love you and I thank you for what you're going to do in these next few moments. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, as you stand and you sing out to the Lord, your pastor's down front, you respond in faith and obedience as the Lord leads you. Hymn of invitation is living for Jesus. Thank you.
What a powerful message this morning that we have heard. What a powerful service that we have all been a part of today. Brother, when you first came in with that stick, I thought you were going to throw that down. It was going to become a snake. I was so glad Thad was here. Because Thad was out in the church. Everybody called him a snake. You know? But I'm glad you didn't do that. What a, what a message we've heard. Let's take that to heart. As we don't exit out of a building, we enter into a mission field that needs to see Jesus and hear Jesus and experience Jesus through each and every single one of you. And so as we bow our heads and close in prayer and we have a final song, remember tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a great time of worship with community choir. We're going to have Brother Mark again who's going to preach to us from God's Word. Let's bow our heads for Dear Heavenly Father, God, I'm so thankful for this church. So thankful, Lord, for the commitment to want to come, to gather, and to place ourselves under the instruction of your word. Lord, thankful for Mark. Thankful for the music that we've had this morning. Thankful for what you've done, Lord, through this service thankful, God, that we can come together in spirit and in truth and worship you who alone is worthy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.